Good afternoon. My name is James Lee. I'm a Max Weber Fellow, and today I have the privilege of interviewing Helen Milner uh, from Princeton University. Um, Helen is uh, presenting her research on um, globalization and politics in Europe uh, today at the Max Weber Lecture Series. And so we're ha privileged to have the opportunity to interview Helen, um, I'll, and I will be joined by my colleague um, Aiden um, Ildra, uh, and today we'll be discussing uh, the consequences of globalization, the political backlash against globalization, and adopting a comparative um, perspective on the United States and the European uh, approaches to uh, globalization. Thank you very much. Just to, um, to pick this conversation towards a bit more of a topic on e economic uh, globalization and governance, what we want, what we were discussing with James, is to have your opinion on, on the WTO and uh, the current deadlock that's been, that's been happening on one, to, to be more technical, to delegate the appellate body, and more general, sort of the, the absence of or the, or the growing dissatisfaction the, the way the WTO works. So the question we had is how can we reach an agreement to reform? So what, can you think of any necessary or sufficient conditions as to, that might alleviate these concerns that, that the, the global scene um, and somehow come up with a way to reform the system? So we know, we, we, we've heard that reform is necessary, everybody's been talking about it, but nobody really goes about how we can actually achieve that. So we're wondering if you can uh, yeah. sort of... What's really interesting to me is that WTO was seen as one of the strongest international economic institutions that we had uh, in place um, uh, uh, in, the, in the global system for many years. And all of a sudden it started looking very sort of shaky. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, first, the, the Doha round just stalled, um, and then you had countries negotiating preferential trade agreements, which are sort of outside the WTO, although the WTO has tried to bring them inside, uh, but not very successfully. Um, and then we thought the dispute settlement body was the thing that was really the strongest part, and now you've seen that being attacked, um, uh, in particular by the United States, which is, of course, a worrisome thing. Um, and you know, the, I think one of the big concerns is how China is treated and whether China is treated as an unmarket economy or not, um, as a developing economy or not, and, and some of the other big economies um, like India as well, uh, and whether they should receive special treatment any longer or be uh, treated, um, you know, as the re like the rest of the developed world. Uh, I think these issues are very, very tough. Um, on the Doha round and the nego negotiation of a big series of tariff uh, reductions, I, I don't see that happening for a long time. Um, not with the United States certainly going in the direction it's been going in. Um, with the dispute settlement body, um, I think that's, that's a tough one because most of the other countries object to American use of things like anti-dumping duties. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's one of the things that's been getting, uh, you know, raising issues. Uh, um, and so the U.S. doesn't want to give up those things. Other countries don't want to be subjected to those things. Um, and um, that's going to be a very tough issue, especially in this more nationalist kind of environment. Um, and then the treatment of, of country, company, you know, economies like the Indian and the Chinese, um, I think that's also a very difficult issue because they don't want to give up that no. status. No, uh, no that's, uh, that's a good point actually. So would you then, I'm just curious as to your opinion as to how we can st sort of move move on with the global economic governance beyond the WTO. Could there be a way, then in an alternative fora, that could it be established or would it be better, so to speak, just to stick to what we have and try to reform it? as such. I mean, it's a big question, I know, but I was wondering if you could shed light a little bit on um. Yeah, I mean, I'm very s sort of worried about the multilateral structure of global governance. I, I think that right now with countries at very different speeds and moving in different directions uh, in terms of economic policy, it's going to be very hard to find a, a strong multilateral forum. So I think what you're starting to see are more regional forums um, and the preferential trade agreements that have dispute settlement processes and um, things like that. Um, one sort of centered more around China and one centered around the EU and one centered around uh, uh, the United States. Um, and sadly, I think that's probably the direction you're going to be going in, uh, these more regional forums. 
um, with uh, the three sort of large economies, uh, you know, Europe, uh, the U.S., and, and, and its allies, and, and China, uh, moving in, in slightly different directions um, in terms of what they allow. Um, because again, the central problem about how much government intervention you're going to allow in the economy is, is a big issue with the, all the Chinese state-owned enterprises and um, just the ability of the Chinese government to be involved in kind of even private you know, enterprises and things like that. So I think those are very tough issues to settle on a multilateral basis. Just to follow up on uh, what you said about there being regional forums, um, if you would imagine that kind of regional forum in, for example, East Asia, where now there's growing um, great power rivalry, and the United States and China are entrenched in, in their own um, political and security differences, um, could, would the establishment of that kind of a regional grouping be politically controversial? Would it be unstable? I'm just trying to get a sense of what that would look like um, kind of on the ground. I mean, I think there'll be overlapping memberships as well, as, like as you see in the AIIB and the World Bank and things like this, where you've got, um, you know, the United States and its allies, kind of South Korea and Japan, and then some of the smaller Southeast Asian countries um, uh, in a grouping, and then you've got China with some of the smaller Southeast Asian countries, and maybe South Korea also in a grouping. Um, and, and so there's going to be overlap there, and it's going to be, I think, for many of those smaller economies in Southeast Asia, and, you know, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, all of them, it, it's going to be uncomfortable because they're going to be betwixt and between the United States and its allies and, and China, um, and being pushed and pulled in slightly different directions. But I think for those countries, it may actually, while it may be uncomfortable for them, I think it may be a good bargaining position for them to be in. <laughs> Because yeah. they may get something from, from both the United States and China right. uh, in an attempt to sort of win them over and be able to kind of maneuver between the two big giants rather than, than just become, you know, allied with one rather than the other. And to follow up uh, on this question of the role of the United States in all of this, uh, the current administration has been portrayed as turning back on the United States' commitment uh, to globalization. Uh, and so along that line, would you agree with that assessment? Um, and in general, uh, how would you assess the impact of the current U.S. administration on the uh, long-term development of American foreign economic policy? This administration does not like multilateralism, and that's one reason why I'm so pessimistic, I guess, about uh, the, uh, you know, reforming the multilateral institutions as well as developing any new multilateral institutions. Now, that's not to say if in four to, you know, six years or you know two to six years we don't have new presidents and they're more um, you know sort of warm toward multilateralism you couldn't see some changes but I think right now it's going to be very very difficult because countries interests are in, in very different directions but this administration doesn't like multilateralism um, they would rather deal bilaterally uh, with the different players I think Trump is pretty protectionist and I think he thinks that protectionism is going to help his uh, supporters and his voters, um, or, and that they like protectionism, um, whether it helps them economically or not. And so I think that he at least is going to keep moving things in this direction. Um, and that's going to make it uh, you know, pretty hard for the US to lead an open world economy uh, if you're moving in that direction. And so I think it's going to be up to the Europeans and the Chinese actually to provide leadership going forward for a kind of global, open, multilateral world economy. Um, and I worry that neither one of those um, countries or well, entities <laughs> um, uh, is, is really going to be able to play that role. Um, and again, that then leads you more into this fragmented, more regional uh, set of uh, kind of, you know, blocks, economic blocks and things like that. Um, with you know some countries crossing over uh, uh, among those blocks, but um, you know things things could change, uh, but I don't see it with this administration at all. And given um, the what appears to be at this point um, bipartisan support in the United States for uh, tariffs against China, um, correct me if, I, if I'm wrong uh, in this characterization. But um, given that there seems to be a wide degree of support for tariffs against China, uh, 
should we be concerned that there isn't, there may not be a, a major political party in favor of globalization, um, and is this likely to be temporary, or is it a more uh, of, of a long-term development in American domestic politics? The United States has always been pretty protectionist, and if you look back historically, um, it, it's the odd period between sort of 1950 and you know 2015 or 16 that the U.S. kind of wasn't overwhelmingly protectionist. Um, so uh, historically, I think you, you've had this tendency toward protectionism in the United States. It's a big, big uh, economy. Uh, it doesn't need trade as much as anybody else. Um, you know, as any other country pretty much does, has a lot of natural resources, uh, especially now that it's become much less dependent on oil and things like this. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's a natural tendency for protectionism, I think, in, in all big economies, but, but, you know, especially in the U United States. And um, I think that in the longer term, I think the question now is, is you know, we've seen their winners and losers from globalization, and the question is, um, we used to think, I think, you know, some of Ron Rogowski's work sort of uh, suggested to us that the winners economically were going to be the winners politically. And the question now is, are the winners economically really going to be the winners politically, or are they going to be the losers politically? They look like they're starting to be the losers politically. Um, and so uh, I think, you know, if that's the case, uh, I think you're going to see much more of this long-term trend toward protectionism and closure and more isolationism. Um, which I think is, you know, in my opinion, probably going to be too bad for the world economy as well as for, for the U.S. economy over time because that kind of closure is unlikely to promote um, uh, rapid economic growth, it's unlikely to promote productivity, it's unlikely to promote technological uh, innovation uh, and all the things that probably help make life a little bit better for people. Yeah, so we have one last question for you, just to bring this bit of an overarching uh, EU and the US story. So we hear a lot about backlash against globalization, we, we talked a lot of it as well. So we're wondering if you can sort of draw a few parallels and differences within the EU and the US and the backlash. I mean, usually in the media also we, we hear it as like, in the West, this, 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 this. So we're wondering if you can sort of give us a clue as to your opinions, some differences and some parallels backlash against globalization in Europe and uh, in the US? I can try. <laughs> it's a big topic. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think there, um, a similarity is what I started out with, this job polarization. I think that uh, because they're advanced industrial economies, um, both uh, the major West European economies at least um, and the United States have experienced this hollowing out of the center both in terms of jobs and in terms of wages. Um, the countries have experienced globalization a little bit differently because the Europeans tend to have more regulation around jobs and they tend to have these very protected insider jobs. And what's happened in Europe is that the young people coming up have been squeezed out of the job market. And so there's pretty serious underemployment and unemployment among those uh, under you know, 35 in, in Europe, where that's probably not the case in the United States. Um, those people can enter the job market. Some of them do really well in the job market, but a lot of them don't do well, and they end up um, working in jobs that they're, much, uh, they're too qualified for. Uh, and so their wages don't look great either, but they've got jobs. Yeah. So, so that's kind of a, a difference that you're seeing there, and I think one, that's one reason why um, in the United States the young are not kind of extreme right populist by and large, but in Europe you're seeing this move of younger people toward the extreme right, uh, which is at least, uh, I know France better and there you're seeing a bit of it, um, which is kind of scary that the young would be moving in this direction. So that's sort of one similarity that's also a difference uh, in things. Um, I, I think in the United States you have different electoral, you know, it's a different electoral party system than in Europe. So in Europe you can have lots of parties in most of these systems except, except the UK um, where you've got the same sort of uh, two party first past the post uh, system. So you're much more likely to have fewer parties. Uh, and in the United States third parties just have not ever done very well. So you've got in Europe the ability to have extreme right parties, to have multiple extreme right parties, 
Um, and that then promotes a totally different type of politics than in the United States, where probably those, those political sentiments have to be incorporated into the two big parties. Uh, and so um, I think that leads to a, a, a quite different feel um, for how things will, will, will operate uh, in, in terms of the future. So those would be um, some, of the, some of the issues. I mean, Europe is much more trade dependent. It's much more globalization dependent than the United States. Uh, so I think isolationism, protectionism for Europe is a harder, a more costly kind of strategy than it is for the United States. Um, uh, Europe just doesn't have the natural resources even that the United States does uh, in addition. So um, uh, that, uh, I, as I said, I think Europe is going to have to be a leader for a multilateral open uh, global economy um, because of some of those things. And the question is whether it can really organize itself into a unitary rational actor and, and do that. Um, in the United States, protectionism is, is a much more feasible, and isolationism are a much more feasible kind of uh, uh, project, I think. Well, on that interesting note, I think uh, we can end our interview. Thank you very much.